this time. Here we go. We want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook this morning. God bless you. We're glad to have you with us. And uh, Linda up in Maine. Praise the Lord. Brother Joe, come up, come up here so you can say hi to your sister. He doesn't get to see her that often. She don't get to see him that often. And uh, I just thought I'd bring him up here this morning and uh, just give her a good shout. Hallelujah. Well, actually, she tells me Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me get your mic so, so she can hear you. Actually, she tells me every week that she watches the service, and she, and she always reminds me, she says, yeah, Joe, she says, oh, I saw the back of your head this week. I know you went to church. So, Lynn, here's the front of my head. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So we welcome you. We welcome Sajiv in India. God bless our brother Sajiv as he watches faithfully every Sunday, every Wednesday, uh, Bible study. Praise the Lord. Let's just open a word of prayer. Father, thank you that you said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Father, for lifting the burden of my heart this morning concerning that young boy. Lord, I believe he's with you. I don't believe you reached the age of accountability yet, where he fully understands. And Father, I, I pray, God, for the family. I, I don't know what the circumstance or situation is, but I pray for them, Father, that through this tragedy, God, that they will come to know you. From what I understand, they have no religion in their life whatsoever, and I don't know why or what their circumstances are, but Lord, we pray for them this morning. We pray, God, for your heavenly touch upon their life that will draw them to you. And through this tragedy, they will come to know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and the power of your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, bless this message today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Isaiah this morning. To the book of Isaiah. You know, the Bible says, be ready in season, out of season. And so one Sunday, I'm just going to come up to you and tell you, get up there and preach. You better get ready. You don't know who you are, so be ready. As you're turning to the book of Isaiah, um, let me just uh, say to you that so much is happening in the world today, so much is going on with security. If you look and you, you see that people's identities are being stolen and they have LifeLock and they have this security system and on your computer you have a security system, you have an antivirus uh, program to stop viruses and all kinds of things from creeping in. There's all kinds of security. But the one thing that I, I see that is very low-keyed, if I could say on a, on a volume knob, if you know you have a volume knob 1 to 10, I want to say that the volume knob is turned down to one when it comes to uh, warning of the church of Jesus Christ. You don't hear too much warning. If you turn on the television, you don't hear too much warning. If you turn the radio on, you don't hear too much of warning the church of the impending doom that's about to come upon the earth. And I guess because people want to be lulled to sleep. I think people like the folding of the hands, the slumbering and the sleeping. And so what happens is the church has kind of fallen into the very secularism that the world has, has been operating in and becomes very dull and very tired and very sleepy. But I want you to know that in the church, especially in the nation of Israel, as we're going to study this morning, we're going to read this morning, that God sets up watchmen. And I want to speak to you this morning about watchmen on the wall. Watchmen on the wall. That God has called us to be watchmen, the leaders, those who are supposed to be watching out for your soul. We're supposed to be observing the times and of what's happening and to let you know what is going on, just in case you don't have that information available to you. 
But before I get into my text, which is going to be uh, Isaiah chapter 56, verse 9 to 12, before I get into my text, I want to read uh, an introduction to that in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. And maybe Pastor can put that up for me. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17. Hallelujah. As he's doing it, I'll take a little sip of water. He says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. How many preachers today are doing that? How many preachers today are warning you and letting you know the word of the Lord that's coming from his heart? How many are standing behind the pulpits in America today and are giving messages that sometimes we don't want to hear? But we have set up teachers to tickle our ears. To make us feel good. To be positive, not negative. To be prosperous, not in need. And we have these preachers that are preaching this way, but they're never there to warn you about what the Lord says that they've been called to do. He says, I have made thee a watchman. What is a watchman? A watchman is one who stands on God, who is continuously and perpetually looking out for the enemy. And how many know that the enemy has a slick way of sneaking into and slying his way into different things in our lives? But God says, I made you a watchman unto the house of Israel, but also to the church. And therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me, the Lord says. <clears throat> so let's go back to Isaiah. I just want to preface that first, that it's God who calls and sets up the watchman. It's not a society. It's not a ministry. Just because somebody ordains somebody doesn't mean they're called. I was reading something on Facebook the other day. almost made me throw up. It was, I, I believe it was the Episcopal Church was, uh, was gi giving a blessing to an abortion clinic and saying that they are being used by God. I mean, if that's not blind... Faith. If that's not, they're, they're not Christian. I'm sorry. You know, everybody, we throw a word around today, Christian, because it sounds good. But that's not Christian. The word Christian is follower of Christ. Does Christ do that? Would Christ do that? No, he wouldn't. But today, Christian is just an association or just a denominational affiliation. But he says, hear the words... I have made thee. I. It's God appointed. God called. Oh, how we need God called preachers today. You know, there are preachers that are just in it for the opportunity to preach. There are preachers that are in it just for the opportunity to receive money. There's those that are in, in it for just for the popularity of being popular and being up in front and being admired by people. I don't have that problem. I don't have to be up here. I don't have to be preaching. I don't have to be admired. I don't have a self-esteem problem. I don't have low self-esteem where I have to be affirmed and affirmed and affirmed and affirmed and affirmed because I've come to the conclusion that not everyone is going to like me. And can I fill you in on a big secret? Not everyone's going to like you either. So we're all in it together. Hallelujah. Not everyone's going to like me, but not everyone's going to like you. Okay, and I'm not here to please you. I want to. It's my desire to. But guess what? I've got to be the voice of God, and I've got to hear him speak so that I can give you what's on his heart. Amen? Isaiah 56, verse 9 to 12. It says, All ye beasts of the field come to devour, yea, all ye beasts in the forest. Verse 10, his watchmen 
are blind. Hmm. Notice it says his watchmen. They were called by God, appointed by God to be his watchmen. But something has happened to them. Something has grasped their attention and taken their attention away from the duty that they were called to do, which was what? To hear his voice and speak what's on his heart and give it to the people. Many watchmen today are just trying to give you nice flowery sermons that will make you feel good for a half an hour until you go home. But it's not about you coming to feel good. It's coming here so that you can learn what it is to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, to know what it is to live a crucified life, to know how to surrender your life, to know how to serve others, and how to be effective for the kingdom of God. That's why God called you. Each and every one of us are called by God to a purpose. You have a, a tremendous purpose to fulfill in God's kingdom. It's so sad that some are going to just sit back and not receive anything from the Lord. He says, his watchmen are blind. That means that if they are blind, that there was a time when they weren't blind. Can I tell you, that's many preachers today in, in, the, in America. Their churches, they started out on fire for God. They started out with a word from God. They start, they start out with a call from God. And what has happened is that they've allowed the popularity of ministry and the success of ministry to be run like an organization rather than an organism. And what has happened is, is they are looking more to the prophet, P-R-O-F-I-T, than the P-R-O-P-H-E-T. They're looking to more to the financial aspect, and they don't want to say anything that will offend some of their biggest givers. And so they turn their blind eye. I remember Brother Diamond one time sharing with me, he had a man in his assembly that had a son, and the son was coming to church, uh, I believe, with his girlfriend, and, and uh, they had been in church for a long time. They had been Christians. But he was living with his girlfriend. And uh, Brother Diamond would preach the word, and he'd be talking about fornication, you know, just reading the word. And this man's father came to him and said, uh, Brother Diamond, he says, uh, my son came to me and said that he may not be attending the church anymore because he's offended because you keep preaching about fornication. And he's living with his girlfriend, and he doesn't see anything wrong with it. And so, you know, you need to stop preaching that. Now, if any of you know Brother David Diamond, okay, his first reaction went something like this. What? He said, say what? He said, yeah. He says, uh, in fact, he says, you know, I'm, I'm one of the largest tithers in your church. I tithe $10,000 a month. That's a lot of money. And he says, if you don't, uh, don't stop softening your message on this, he says, uh, I'm just going to pull my tithes and leave. Brother Diamond put his head down and said, don't let the door hit you in the... I'll say it that way. But Brother Diamond's a little more coarse than I am. See, but many would not do that. They want to, you know, they want to uh, kind of pat it, you know what I mean? Because preachers sometimes do a lot of things for money. Christians will do a lot of things for money. I don't have that problem because I don't have a lot of money. Okay. And it reminds me of a story. If, can I tell you a story real quick? Can I just depart from this and give you a quick story? There was a, there was a, a church, uh, it was Assembly of God Church down south, you know, uh, and uh, they got a phone call and the secretary answered, you know, First Assembly of God Church in, in Waterford. And the, the man said, uh, he said, yes, he said, I'd like to speak to the head hog, please. And the secretary said, what? He said, I want to speak to the head hog. She said, the head hog? You, you can't be talking about our pastor. He said, yeah. He said, I want to talk to the head hog. She said, 
well, I, I don't know if I'm going to let you do that with such disrespect for our pastor, calling him a head hog. And he, and he said, well, ma'am, he said, I'm sorry to hear that. He said, I was calling because I have a $100,000 check to give him. She said, wait a minute, I think I see the fat pig coming down the aisle right now. <laughs> the, wa the watchmen are sleeping. They're sleeping. He said, they're blind. They can't see properly. What did Jesus say about the blind? Don't follow the blind, because the blind, will, you'll fall into a ditch. And never follow Linda when she's riding a bicycle, because you'll go in a ditch. She has experience. The blind leading the blind. He said, my watchmen, they're blind. They're all... Now, these are not my words, so don't get mad at me if I'm... You know, if you're thinking about your favorite preacher, don't, you know, don't get mad at me, okay? These are not my words. These are God's words. God said it, not me. They are all ignorant. So you can't throw anything at me. Not my words. See, these, these pillow prophet preachers don't want preaching like that. They don't want to represent a God who calls them ignorant. They're ignorant. They want a, a, a nice Jesus, you know. Tone it down to number one on the volume scale. But not only does he call them ignorant, which means absent of being able to rightly discern things. He said, but they are all dumb dogs. You ever see a dumb dog? A dumb dog is one who chases cars and bangs into the pole. Or bangs into a parked car. A dumb dog is when you throw something and he just sits there. A dumb dog won't come when you call his name, but you call another name, he comes. A dumb dog. God called them preachers, them watchmen, dumb dogs. But what do we hear those adherents that follow that follow those ignorant preachers? What do we what, what do they say? Don't touch God's anointed. Don't touch God's anointed. Dumb dogs. Not my words. God's word. They're all ignorant. Why are they ignorant? Why are they dumb dogs? Because they will not preach what's on God's heart. He said in Ezekiel, I made thee a watchman to the house of you, therefore hear the word at my mouth and give it to them. They don't want that word. They don't want the word that comes out of the mouth of God. They only want a sweet word, a, a nice word. He said they are blind. They are ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Dumb dogs, ignorant, and they can't bark. So you, buy, you go out and you buy a dog to guide your house, to guide your property, to guide your family, and you got a dumb dog that can't bark, but when a crook breaks into your house, he comes up, starts fellowshipping with the burglar. The 
burger can pet him, rub his stomach, and he's rolling on the ground. That's a dumb dog. You didn't get the dog for that. You get him to, to watch your house. I remember last summer, we had our windows open. And you know that there's people that go around collecting the, uh, the cans and stuff like that and the garbage. When on garbage day, when it's out there, they're out there. You can hear them at 4 o'clock in the morning with their, with their shopping cart that they stole. <laughs> going down the road. <laughs> but then we heard our dog next door bark. <laughs> then the dog across the street. <laughs> you got all these dogs barking. <laughs> They're supposed to be warning. There's a stranger there. They don't know who the stranger is. But can I tell you, these preachers, these watchmen, they're not, they're dumb dog. They can't even bark. They won't even warn the people. They won't even tell the people. They won't even speak what's on God's mind or heart. They're dumb dogs. They're sleeping. Ever see a sleeping dog? Man, when a dog, you know, you know, I, I know I love my son from Africa. Brother Sam. I said, I called him, I said, Sam, you've been getting some sleep. Oh, Daddy. Last night I slept like a dead dog. <laughs> you see these dogs, they, they they don't move for nothing. Lying down, loving to slumber. You see those old hound dogs? Man, you know, the, all, the, all the bones are just, just laying there. Come on, boy. Come on, get up. I know some people like that. <laughs> Come on, let's go do something. And try to move them. They don't move. They just stay there. Nothing moves them. They're more interested in just sleeping and, and making everything peaceful and nice. You know, they don't want to they don't want to rock the boat. They love to slumber. Now remember, this is God speaking. This ain't preacher speaking. This is God's heart. Look at verse uh, ten. Uh, verse 11, I'm sorry. Yea, they are greedy dogs. They're greedy. You know what greedy means? You can't get enough of that funky stuff. Remember that song? Years ago? Can't get enough of that funky stuff. You can find it on YouTube. They can't get enough. They always want more. I mean, look at Turn on your television set. You'll see these preachers. They're never satisfied. They always want more. I remember when it was, you know, when I first got saved, you know, you had CBN and you had, you know, PTL and you had some of the other programs. You know, they would say, if you could really sacrifice and send $30. Now, they want you to fill out a, 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 a policy for when you die, they can get all your stuff. They want you dead. Think about it. Because they know when you die, they're going to get some stuff. So they want you to fill out, you know, uh, your, your, you know your, your, your wishes at the end when you die, you know, where you want to distribute all your stuff. They want it all. And then it went from 25 to 35, then it went to 50, then 75, then 100. Now it's 1,000. So your $1,000 seed. They're greedy. Because most of that money pays for their television time. Just think if we took all the money that's wasted on people sitting on their... I'll be nice. All right, sitting on their duffs. 
at home and won't go to church because they believe in this media TV. God never intended media TV. If you're an invalid and you can't get out, fine. But God wants you in church because you have gifts and talents that he wants to use and bless other people with that you can't get in church on media. If that's the case, get a mannequin husband if you need a husband. Why not? Quiet. Thank you. People are getting more and more and more away from church because they don't have a good outlook about themselves. They don't think they have anything to offer God. You have everything. The Bible says that God has given you everything that pertaineth unto life and godliness, and you have gifts and talents that God wants to use, and you refuse. These shepherds, they can't get enough. Look at this. Then he says, they are shepherds that cannot understand. You can tell some of these preachers right to their face. I'm talking about preachers talking to preachers now. And they don't understand. They ain't got the, you know, the, the fat, 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 you know, they, they ain't got a, what am I trying to say, John? <laughs> they ain't got a, one iota of an idea of what you're talking about. I'm serious. I went to a place one time, and a minister, a friend of mine, and I don't mean to dog on any particular denomination, all right? and I'm not dogging on it, but it was an AG church. Because not all AG churches are bad. There are some good ones. And uh, it was a minister's thing. We were all together. It was a prayer meeting, and he introduced me to this uh, 40-year-old, something like that, preacher. And this is, this is how they do it, Joe. This is how they do it, okay? You walk, you, you came over, and he... And I'm going to pretend to be him for a minute, right? So my friend said, oh, this is Pastor Bob in New Bedford. Hey, how you doing? My name is Pastor Ron. Hey, how you doing? How big is your church and where do you, you know, what's your ministry? Are you with the Assemblies of God? Blah, 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 blah. Like the AG is the only church in the whole world that God uses. So you know me. I'm not as bad as David Diamond. I say that bad in a good sense. In case you're watching, Brother Diamond. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, uh, can you answer a question for me? He said, what's that? I said, I have often wondered what AG stands for. Does it mean above God? And the same reaction I got on your face is what is on his face. And he was like uh, Ralph Cramden on the honeymoons. He didn't know what to say. And I had to just assure him, I said, I'm just, I'm just teasing. But see, they don't get it. Because they think about bigger is better, more is successful. That doesn't make you successful if you have more people. They are shepherds that do not understand. Look at this. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Hmm. They're only concerned about themselves. Let me tell you something. When a preacher does something wrong, and he does things the wrong way, he don't last. I'm serious. Okay, we had a situation in our church. Somebody came, we, we loved them, lifted them up, and they turned on us because we wouldn't let them do a certain ministry in the church, and God told me not to let them do it, and they, they went ahead and they got all mad and stuff, and they ended up leaving. They started a church. Aren't you glad you didn't follow them? Because you know why? They're not here anymore. 
Hello? Because it wasn't of God. And I said that from the very beginning. But what does Pastor Bob know? He don't know nothing. Where would you be now? Out left in the cold. But here I am. Because I'm called. Hello? That's not a boastful thing. I'm just telling you. I'm called. If I wasn't called, I would not be here. Believe me. Not because of you. Not because you're a bunch of nasty people. No, I'm not saying that. But if I had my choice, I wouldn't be here. But God has me here. Psalm 127, verse 1, says this. Except the Lord build the house. Hello? See, that's why I know barometers, and I see barometers, and I make predictions when people have done that. We've had two people leave the church and start churches. Guess what? The church is no longer in existence. They have what's called a five-year plan. If things don't work out within that five years or sooner, they... <laughs> How long have we been at this ministry, honey? 12, 14, 15, 16 years? 17 years? And all you got is 41 people or so, 40 people, something like that. You've been at that? What, are you stupid? No, I'm called. I don't go by size. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. See the watchman and, and the and the watchman and the Lord, who is the keeper, if they're not in conjunction with one another, if they're not talking with another, if they're not fellowshipping with another, if they're not, if the, if the watchman's not listening, hello? You understand? See, that's why pastors tell me all the time, oh, this one came to me and asked me for prayer, this one came to me and asked me for prayer. I said to myself, nobody comes to me and asks me for prayer. They make some, make some major decisions and don't even say, pastor, would you pray with us? Even when it came to marriage. Pastor, will you come? Would you pray with, for me? Even Priscilla never, never came to me and asked me for prayer because you know why? Come on. Don't want to hear it. And I'll use that as an example because in Priscilla's early days she was learning and she was growing. You know, she wasn't always the, the smiley, cutie little girl she is today, you know. No, she, she struggled, okay? And she had this boyfriend, you know, and, and so forth. And, you know, she felt guilty because he helped her through her sickness. And that's why it was guilt. It wasn't love, it was guilt. God told me, he's not the one for her. And she came in my office. I'll never forget this. She came in my office. She said, I need to talk to you, Papa. She called me Papa. So I need to talk to you, Papa. She came in and she sat down at my desk. This was at the other building over there, the other place. And I said, what's going on, honey? She went, already engaged. I said, oh, you had your nails done? I said, oh, she says, we're going to get married. Now, you know how much I love Priscilla. If you don't, I do. And I said to her, honey, I'm sorry I can't marry you. That was one of the hardest things for me to say to her. She just welled up with tears and began to weep. And I said, sir, I said, this has nothing to do with you. I'm sure you're a nice person, but you're not the one for her. God has somebody else. Then, of course, he got defensive. 
And I'm telling you this for a reason. Shepherds that care. Shepherds that can see down the road a little bit that will warn you. Hello? Because we're objective. We're behind, you know, we can see the whole picture. You know, when you people are in love, forget it, man. You, you guys walk around like this. You know what I'm talking about, right? You're all glassy-eyed, man, and you, you know, you got a, you know, you got this, you got bit by this love bug. So I told, I said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. Give me a year. Let me see your development for a year, son. Let me see your development for a year, and let me see how you interact with church and people, and let's see how that goes. And then after a year, I promise you, if you, if I see the fruit that I need to see, I'll, I'll marry. So they left. You know what I did? I started praying. I said, God, please. She won't listen to me. Send other people to tell her that. We've had preachers come in. And after service, they come to me and say, who's that girl back there? I said, oh, that's Priscilla. Who's that guy with her? I said, that's her fiance. That's not the one for him. God told me that's not the one for him. I said, don't tell me. Go tell her. And that preacher would go take her aside, say that. I think it happened four or five times to her of the different creatures that came in. At one time, Lloyd's dad came to me. Of course, he's a little rough, you know. Who's that guy over there? I said, oh, that's Priscilla's fiance. That's not the one for me, for him, for her. I said, why are you telling me? Go tell her. So he went and told her. About two weeks later, I guess she got the hint. She called me up crying. Oh. I said, what's the matter, honey? I did it. I broke off the engagement. See, because she listened to the watchman. Hello? Listened. Now, I'm not talking about shepherding you, and I'm not talking about telling you what color shoes to wear, I'm not t trying to tell you what dress to wear, what shirt to wear. I'm not, that, that's foolishness. When it comes to some of these decisions, you want to talk to somebody who has wisdom, someone who has understanding, someone who has gone through the experiences of hearing from God. Hello? And guess what? When you do, you're the benefitor. You're the benefactor. How many times... Some of you here, you don't have to raise your hand. Some of you here, I told you to take a lesser job for less money and you got blessed in the end. Hello? Same with Jen's testimony. She was working at the place she's working now and she just couldn't take it because this guy was just rubbing her the wrong way. I mean, she would get angry, mad, and that time she used to curse. And it wasn't nice words. With very bad words fluently flowing from her mouth. And so she decided to leave. And she went to work at a daycare center who Celeste used to come to our church was working. And they got to talking and she invited her to church. See how it works? And then she came to church and you know the rest of the story. See, except the Lord builds a house, they that labor in vain, that try to build it. And the watchman waketh, in, but in vain. It's so important to know that there are preachers that just don't want your money. In fact, I was talking to Brother Bob the other day. I said, when's the last time I preached on tithing? How many, how many remember me ever preaching a message on tithing? Or giving? Or offerings? How many times do we take an offering? You see me take one on Monday night? You see me take one on Wednesday night? No, once in a while when the Spirit of the Lord will, will move on me, if somebody, I feel somebody wants to, God wants to bless somebody, I'll call them up and we'll all bless them. But if it's not me. Hello? We don't take three, three or six offerings a week. I'll tell you, Nigerian churches, boy, they take offerings about ten times in one service. 
But see, I, I, I kind of I got wise to the Nigerian church because, you know, if, if they're going to give an offering of, say, $50, right, and they're going up 10 times, they'll throw $5 a time. That's how they do it. And I love their offerings because they dance, you know. But the women kind of dance a little funky. I don't like the way they dance. <laughs> some of them ought to keep some stuff where it belongs. Okay, but uh, I, love, I love how they do that in Nigeria. Sorry if Nigeria is watching. I'm sorry. I don't mean no, no disrespect whatsoever. What's the reason why you need a sober watchman? Why is it that you need somebody in your life, like the, Bible, uh, like the Bible says, obey those that have the rule over you, for they watch for your soul? What we got is a lot of independent babies that think they know better than the pastor. They think, oh, well, you know, I, I know more. I, can, I know the better. Like Moses, the time of Moses when... Uh, you know, uh, the, the people came to him and said, why do you make yourself holy? We're all holy too. Okay. We'll see. A little time will tell. You can never, 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 never outrun experience. I'd rather have a surgeon who has operated 10,000 times on the same operation I'm getting than somebody coming out of out of a, a medical school that's got nerve problems. I don't want that guy holding that scalpel. This is my first one. Imagine, Joe, if you're the first one. Have you done this before? And you're on the table. No, this is my first one. You're it, Guinea. <laughs> no, you want someone with experience. Well, let's look at 1 Peter 5, verses 8 to 9. It's amazing that God calls people blind, ignorant, dumb dogs. Well, I guess, I guess, I guess God needs to go through some, uh, some kind of training, you know, to pacify, you know, anger management maybe kind of get right a little bit, you know, he uses too many harsh words. You know, he's not politically correct. You know, God's not politically correct, so we've got to strain out God. That's how preachers treat God today. They say God's politically incorrect, so we've got to tone it down. We've got to put the volume on one. No. I say this, if, if you ain't got the guts to stand up and preach the truth, all of God's truth, not just a portion of the truth, all of it. Yes is love, but he hates also. He gets angry. His wrath is on people. People. The wrath of God is on the children of disobedience, the Bible says. Preach it all. Don't preach just a little bit so that everybody can be nice and you can have a big church. 1 Peter 5, verses 8 to 9. It says, Be sober. And be vigilant. Be vigilant means to be with purpose. With design, with desire. Be vigilant. Be aggressive. But he says be sober. Now, I don't know too many Christians that get drunk. Do you? The Bible says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because when you're not, when you're not sober-minded, things happen. It puts, you in, it puts you in predictable situations that you could fall into sin. Trust me. If anybody knows that, Joe and I know that. We were like the two amigos. Okay, setting fire, setting hell on fire before we were Christians. 
We drive all the way to Boston, and we'd go to some pretty hairy places. And we don't know how, well, I know now, but we didn't know how at the time we made it out alive. I'm serious. Down dark alleys, walking down dark alleys, stumbling, singing. Ah, well, that was a great time we had. People approaching us. You remember that? Got robbed. <laughs> I'm serious. When you're sober, you don't do things you normally would do. But also in the spiritual realm. If you're not sober in the spiritual realm, you will fall for things that are not of God. Thousands of people, when they go to church, are looking up for gold. Where's the gold dust? Come on, God, give us gold dust. We want gold dust. Thousands of people want their fillings to be filled with gold. That's what's the matter with porcelain enamel, you know? Why does it have to be gold? A God to give somebody a prosthesis? No, give them a new leg. Because they're not sober, they're, they're flying off the handle, going running to all of these things that they're seeing, supernatural things. But Jesus warned the people, he said, don't follow signs and wonders. There will be lying signs and wonders. Oh, did you see the Virgin Mary in that piece of pizza? Oh my gosh. Then they put the pizza up in the window, they've got to stop traffic, people are all falling all over each other trying to look at the Jesus, you know, the... the Madonna and pizza. We laugh at that, but you know what? It's true. I remember one time they saw the Virgin Mary on a, on a, car, on a tree. Man, the, they had thousands and thousands of people going there to touch the tree. Because they're not sober-minded. Think about it. Just logically think about this. It's a tree. It's a tree. Let me say it again. It's a tree. It's a... <laughs> it's a tree! <laughs> that tree... That tree's been there for 50 years! Could have had the whole apostles by now. <laughs> Come on. It's a tree. I see the apostle Paul in a banana. Come on. I'm, I, I can't, I'm telling you the truth. People see the weirdest things because they're not sober minded. He said, be sober. Be able to make right decisions. Don't be like a drunkard that can't, cannot make logical decisions. I can tell you from personal experience, when I had been drunk, and I mean drunk, and drove my car home, I don't remember how I got there the next day. I don't remember driving. Nothing. I could have ran over a turtle, not even known nothing. I could have hit a human being, not even known nothing. Could have crashed into five cars. That happens, by the way. People crash into cars all the time, drunk, and then they go home and they wake up the next day. What? What happened to my car? Be sober. Church, be sober-minded. Be sober in your thinking. Don't let people or, or situations 
deter you from being sober minded when you think. Be vigilant. When you want something and you desire something, man, you'll travel for miles. I remember Sarah Cardoza when she wanted that Siamese cat. She went all the way to Pennsylvania to get that dumb cat. Yeah. Vicky, <laughs> Vicky said, I can't believe she went all that way for a piece of junk. You know, Vicky, that's just the way she is. She makes me laugh. All that way for a piece of junk. But people, when you want something, you go all out. You put every effort into it. Man, if you have to drive a hundred miles or fifty miles, or, or if you if you need something, you go hunting for that thing on the internet, man, and you be vigilant on that internet, looking all kinds of ways. Oh, I found it now. Yeah, and you get oh, oh it's located in, in Lowell Mass. Okay, get in the car. Mm, all the way to Lowell Mass you go. If you want it bad enough, you'll do it. Why do we have to be sober and vigilant? Because your adversary. You know you have an adversary? You have somebody that will sit right beside you and convince you and talk to you and persuade you not to follow God. Not to come to church. Not to get involved. Come on now. To walk away from God. You were better off in the world. You had more friends. You could have all the drugs and alcohol you wanted. You could have all the men and all the women you wanted in the world. Come on. But well, you know, I, I love what Debbie said to me one time. She said, you know, I could never go back in the world. Because I know what I'm like without Jesus. And that keeps her going. That's like Peter saying, Lord, where can we go? You are the only one that have the words of eternal life. But some people, they just don't care. They take salvation for granted. And I believe it's because they're deceived. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You know where he walks? Right behind you. He's right behind you. When you don't get that healing, he's right behind you. See, God don't love you. He didn't heal you. When you get that disappointment in your life, see, God don't love you. See, why did he get you get disappointed? God don't love you. See, if he loved you, then he would have worked everything out already by now. God, God don't love you because look at you. You're still, still going through all kind of personal anxiety. God don't love you. See, that's what the devil does. Here's the key. Don't listen. Some people have a pity party with the devil. Yeah, God don't love you anymore. I guess he doesn't love me anymore. And God don't love me no more. I feel like God don't love me no more. You start giving in to what the devil's telling you. Oh, that church don't love you anymore. Why? Because we tell you the truth. I remember one time somebody came to me and said, Oh, pastor, I just feel like God's telling me to leave. 
I said, where are you going? Well, I'm going to such and such a church. I said, they ain't God. <laughs> People said, well, pastor, how do you know that so quick? Because I can I know. I, I can't tell you how I know. I just know. God speaks to my heart and says, nope. I said, nope, that ain't God. Well, I feel, you know, I said, that's the problem you feel. They told me where they're going. I said, they can't go there. There's false doctrine in there. Hello? Why would the Holy Spirit lead you into false doctrine? Is that air condition on again? I feel cold. My head's cold. That's where I first got it, right there. Let me fix that. This is not right. We've got to fix this, Pastor, somehow. Yeah, see, the heat went down to a 60 point. Why did it do that? This way I don't have to deal with this. No, I don't want cold. Oh, my word. Somebody help me here, please, so I don't waste time on this thing. Turn this air condition off. We've got to make sure that doesn't happen again. All right, we'll get a new thermostat. This is going to be programmed. I don't know how to program it. We're not sure how to program it. But anyway, as a roaring lion, he walks about seeking whom he may devour. Now, notice he didn't say eat. Now, I know some people that can devour food. I'm sorry? I hope you have an opportunity sometime to take Bob Lewis out for lunch. It'll be one of the fastest experiences you ever had in your life. I mean, oh, Joe, you already had experience, I see, right? <laughs> I mean, before you're done with the mashed potatoes, he's already done with dessert. No, the devil devours. He consumes. He ain't just, he ain't going to come, he ain't going to come, Sister Jeanette, he ain't going to come and, oh, I think I feel the Holy Ghost. No. <laughs> he ain't going to come just take a little nip out of you. You ever get nipped by a dog? He's not going to take a little nip out of you. No, 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 no. He wants to body slam you. And that's the only way I can describe it to you. He wants to take you down. He wants to destroy your, your faith. He wants to ridicule you. He wants to mock you. He wants you to believe his lies so that you get into a little cocoon and go sit in your little corner. Remember Cinderella? In my own little corner, in my own little chair, I can be whatever I want to be. Talk about self-esteem problems. He wants to devour you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. Who do you think that voice is when it says, why don't you just go kill yourself? Who do you think that voice is? He wants to destroy your life. Jeremiah 6.17 in closing. Jeremiah 6.17 in closing. Also I set watchmen over you, saying, <coughs> excuse me, and I set watchmen over you. Over you saying, listen, hearken, listen, listen to the sound of the trumpet. Whenever Israel, and the, how they would call the, the tribes together when it was a problem, they would blow the shofar. 
he says, listen to the sound of the trumpet, because they had different spurts of, of, of sound. One would be like, then they have, whatever the sound was, it meant one certain thing. It was a certain sound when the enemy was approaching. So when that sound of the trumpet came, everyone had to hock in and listen for the sound of the trumpet. Now watch this now. Are you that sensitive to the Holy Ghost? Because the Bible says when Jesus returns, the trump of God will sound. hearing? Are you tuning your ear to be able to listen to that trumpet sound? What's the sound of the trumpet? Is looking and seeing and discerning your time in which you live. He said, you will know it when I'm even at the door. You ever sit home and all of a sudden you feel like someone's at the door? And you go and you open the door and there's somebody at the door. How'd you know that? There was an awareness. There's an awareness. Hmm. I've got something's up. Have you ever had the urge to call somebody because you felt something and you called them and they were going through something? What does that mean? That means that you were aware. You were sober-minded. You were aware. God was able to speak to your heart, and you were able to react on that. The same way. He said, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. You have, a, you have a watchman today telling you, today, right now in this church, hear the sound of the trumpet. But here's the, here's the condition of man. But they said, we will not hearken. Is that you this morning? Are you sitting there saying, I'm not going to hearken. I'm not going to listen. I'm going to do my own thing. Well, the Bible says, and you do that. Don't be surprised when you go to God and God don't answer your prayer. When you're not hearken to the voice of God... Don't be surprised if you end up in the same situation or worse than you were in the beginning. Are you a watchman on the wall? Or are you just a slumbering person, just slumbering through life? Remember the Proverbs talks about the sluggard? A little folding of the hands, a little sleep, and poverty shall creep up on you suddenly. But he said, take note of the ant. They all work together. Man, I see, I see like three or four ants, man, they find a piece of bread, and those ants are dragging that thing, man, dragging that thing, man, they're pushing on that thing. You know, they, they want that thing. They work together, man, they, they build a colony together. Man, we could learn a lot from ants. Now let me close with this. Your main watchman is the Holy Spirit. God sets watchmen in the church like pastors, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. But the main, the main watchman in your life is the Holy Spirit. Be attentive to hear Him. Because there may come a day I'm not here no more. Well, I know there'll be a day when I'm not here no more. So will you. There'll come a day when you're not here on earth anymore. But hearken to the voice, listen to his spirit, and test it to make sure that it's God. Read it, see it in God's word. And if it's in God's word, then obey it with a full heart of assurance that when you obey God, there's blessing on the other side. 